here. We go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. I always love the testimonies and uh, I just think about what God has done and how faithful He's been. And even in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we, we've learned that God is faithful. It's one of the things that the Apostle Paul points out. Without a doubt, you know, it's the ones who struggle with faithfulness is not God, it's us. And uh, it's one thing that we need to get a, a grip on, a handle on. And uh, we, He deserves our faithfulness. And so, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, this is what you see in your bulletin, faithfulness, what God is looking for. It's what I'm preaching on uh, this morning. And so as we get in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, let's go ahead and begin to read verses 1 through 8. It says, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. And moreover, it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. But with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge, judge not my own self, and for I know nothing by myself, and yet am I not hereby justified? But he that judgeth me is the Lord. And therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring the light to hidden things of darkness, and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. And then shall every man have the praise of God in these things. Brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written. And no one of you be puffed up for one against another, for who maketh thee to differ one from another? What hast thou that thou did not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hast not received it? Verse 8 is the last. Now you are full. Now you are rich. You've reigned as kings without us, and I would to God that you did reign, that we might also might reign with you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for this time together. And Lord, I don't want to take it for granted. And what a solemn responsibility it is to be able to stand behind this pulpit and lift up my voice and proclaim your word. And Lord, I pray you help us to be still before you and Lord, to receive exactly what you have to say. Lord, may you challenge our hearts. And Lord, may you help us to be more faithful as a result of your preaching. And Lord, I pray that you would just help me to communicate your message in a way that you see fit. Lord, I, again, I pray for Miss Ann. Lord, for this possibility of surgery coming up. I pray for Miss Ola Swain, for Mr. Swain, for others. But Lord, right now, help us to remove all the distractions from this world and help our minds to be set on you, to be still and know that you're God. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The Bible informs us that God is looking for something in our life, and a thing is not a mystery to, uh, ought not to be a mystery anyway, to any one of us. And He tells us the one thing that He's looking for in your life and my life is faithfulness. And many times I believe that uh, the, the only problem is, is we get confused about what that faithfulness is. We, we confuse faithfulness with success. Or sometimes we might be like the Corinthians and believe that we already are faithful, but yet we're faithful to the flesh and not faithful to the things of God. And we've got to be careful about that. And it becomes completely obvious to the observer of Scripture exactly that what God desires many times, man always messes it up and we always seem to have a knack for confusing things. You, you ever have that problem? You know, when uh, God says that uh, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There is a man in the Old Testament by the name of Cain. He comes and he brings the best of what he has to God. And it's not acceptable in his sight. And God had told him what he wanted. There's, uh, we could go down and we could look at uh, what Balaam said of Israel. The Lord his God is with him and the shout of a king is amongst them. And however, it was a sad day when... God brings the children of Israel over into the promised land and He sets them up. He gives them a house that they didn't work for and vineyards that they didn't plant. And all of a sudden, they begin to ask for them a king like one of the other nations. And so much so that Samuel begins to lament and say, What is this? And God looks at Samuel and He says, They haven't rejected you, they've rejected me. 
as king over them. King Saul in the Old Testament, he, he ascended the battle against Amalek and he's given specific instructions about the battle that he is to take out everything, let nothing remain, not even the sheep or the oxen or anything else. And when, when Samuel comes to confront uh, King Saul about the battle and he hears the bleeding of the sheep behind him, he says, what meaneth the bleeding of the sheep? All these are sacrifices that we're going to give to God. And Samuel looks at him and he says this, Hath the Lord this great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices and obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and hearken than the fat of lambs. And you know, the thing hasn't changed very much over the course of the years. Even, I think it was uh, Micah, or Malachi, I think it was. Malachi. That was Micah. Micah chapter 6. Micah chapter 6, when the Israelites were so confident in themselves, we're bringing this offering and that offering, we're, we're giving the abundance of everything that we have, we're bringing it before God. Doesn't He delight in all this, the abundance of oil? Doesn't He delight in the abundance of sacrifice? Doesn't He delight in everything that we're giving Him? And Micah looks at him. So He has showed thee, O man, and what doth the Lord require to thee? But to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with thy God. And as you see the pattern given to us throughout all of the Scripture, God is expecting one thing and man is giving him something else. God, God wants, a, 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 without the shedding of blood, no remission, and man is giving him the best that he has. God says, Jesus Christ is the only way. Man says, we'll give you religion. Man says, we give you uh, the abundance of sacrifice. God says, I don't want your sacrifice. To obey is better than sacrifice. And on and on it goes. And even when it comes to the area of faithfulness, it's no different. And the only thing that's flawed is our judgment about what God wants. You know, when Samuel was sent to go anoint the next king of Israel, God sent him. To overlook the kings or the, the, the sons of Jesse. Sent them to go anoint the next king. God gives them the instructions. He says, Don't look on the outward appearance. He says, Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. And it was Jesus who says, just really reaffirming exactly what he said in the Old Testament in John chapter 6, or John chapter 7, verse 24, it says, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. And can I tell you this morning, we have a judgment problem. We cannot tell the right from the wrong, the up from the down, the in from the out, the left from the right. Even that's what uh, the Lord told uh, Jonah when he sent him into Nineveh. He says, you, you, you have sympathy over this gourd that's withered away. And how can you not have sympathy over the children of Nineveh who don't know their right hand from their left hand? They don't know evil from good. They don't know bad from, from good. I mean, they don't, they don't know these things. God's not looking for what we can give them, but for what He gave, His only begotten Son. He's not looking for sacrifice, but obedience. He's not looking for success, but faithfulness. And it's on the subject of faithfulness that we approach this text this morning. And uh, how underappreciated and underprized this quality is. You know, many times when we think about a good marriage, a good marriage is not made on uh, all the things that you are able to give unto your wife or all the things you are able to give unto your husband. It's not made on just all the things that you have achieved. A good marriage is built on faithfulness. And as husbands, we, we have to realize, and many times we'll say this when we get married, you know, my wife is a gift unto me, and true, the Bible says that your wife is a gift from the Lord. And if you appreciate that marriage, you ought to steward that marriage, be faithful to that marriage, and give everything that you have to that marriage, and be just not only to your wife, I know that your wife is the main thing, but to God as well. We look at the children and we think of the children and we say, Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord, so they are. I thank God for our four boys, but we ought to steward those boys. They are a gift from God. We ought to do everything that we can to nurture them in the, the admonition of the Lord. Because they're a gift. Be faithful. To our children, yes, they're going to try our patience. <laughs> and that might be an understatement, as I heard this morning. But uh, we ought to be faithful to them. 
as a gift. The most precious gift of all the world was God's only Son. He went to the cross to die for us and give us eternal life. And those who accepted that free gift of salvation through Him and His blood have been given new life. And don't you think that we ought to be faithful to Christ with that new life that He's blessed us with? The Bible declares, Great is thy faithfulness. Jeremiah receives these words after recounting the Lord's mercies are new every morning. A man who preached during dark and troublesome times, times of uncertainty, a man who was tempted to quit time and time again, and in fact, at one time that he tried to quit, he said the Word of God burned within him, just is in his bones. But he couldn't shut up without... Uh, he, he, had to, he had to keep on preaching and keep on proclaiming and keep on reaching and keep on going. He had to keep being faithful. It's easy to be faithful during the good times, but it's hard to be faithful during the bad times. When we think about what Paul is trying to communicate here to the Corinthian believers, he's communicating a message of faithfulness, not just going with the flow when things are easy, but when things are hard as well. And I believe that this is what he's trying to get across to him, faithful. Moses is said in the book of Hebrews to be faithful above all God's house. Led the children of Israel through the wilderness, and sometimes I think that he wanted to strangle some of those who were amongst his group. And other times he strikes the rock instead of speaking to the rock, and he says, you rebels! You know he got upset. But God says he was faithful. God took notice of him, and the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews that he endured as seeing him who was invisible. In fact, that's what the book of Hebrews is all about. Hebrews is all about faithfulness. He shows us the, the, just the whole substance and the subject of everything that it is to be faithful. He says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him, but he that comes to God must believe that He is, and He's a rewarder to them that diligently seek Him. This is what faith is. It's, it's, it's anchored in God. It's anchored in who He is. It's anchored in that hope that we have in Him. Of Christ is entered within the veil. But it just doesn't stay anchored. It goes forward. It moves on. It perseveres. It triumphs over trouble. It rejoices even in tribulation. It keeps going when, when it doesn't feel like keep going. When you look at the life of Abraham and, 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 and Abel and several of the others that's mentioned to the Hebrew Hall of Faith, uh, Moses and, and, and Daniel and and many of the others that are listed on throughout there, it doesn't say that they went for a little space of time. No, they kept on going. Jacob is listed there in the midst of them. I mean, if Jacob could do it, the scoundrel, I think we could do it too. But it pictures the fact that we are oriented to fulfilling a life that's pleasing to God who's given these precious promises. Now let me ask you the question. Have we traded faithfulness to God for false promises? Have we traded faithfulness to God for something else? Because this is what God is looking for. Let us strive to please the one who has called us unto himself. And we see here that we must remain faithful in your outline this morning. You see that there at the top of your page. And I want to look at several things here. Our relationship, our requirement, the reason, and the response here. As we look at this idea of faithfulness that's given to us here in our text. And we see first of all our relationship. The quickest way to fall out of fellowship with God is trying to live up to men's standards, you know. And, uh, you know... It's, it seems to me when I was growing up, that's what I tried to do. I tried to live up to please my parents. I tried to live up in order to, uh, to, to be something. To try to achieve some sort of success. Uh, reach a utopia that never did exist. Wherever that, that level is, I wasn't quite sure. But I did the best that I could to try to please mom and dad. Did the best I could to even try to please this flesh so I could brag about what I've, come, what I've overcome and what I've accomplished and what I've done. I mean, this was before I was saved. 
But this is the only thing that I knew was to try to, uh, to, to achieve. Many times this is what we try to do. We leave faithfulness to God out of the picture and try to live up to men's standards and then next thing you know we fail in those expectations and we fall in our fellowship with God. God's designed the church in such a way that He has gifted it with many different abilities and leadership skills and by no means when we look here at our text where it says, let a man so account of us as a ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. He's by no means diminishing what God has done in his life. He has called him to be the apostle to the Gentiles. And that was no small thing. The man who persecuted the church to the uttermost, who compelled men to go into the prisons, he wasn't saying, hey guys, I, I am nothing. His, his apostleship, because God has gifted him with a message to communicate to the Corinthian church, that was something to be accounted for. But only so much as in they were God's words, not His. In verse 16, he says in the same chapter, Be ye followers of me. In other words, follow my example as I follow Christ. However, uh, he, didn't want, he didn't want to be involved in some sort of man worship of personalities. Paul wanted the Corinthian believers to have a proper perspective of men. He wanted them to be understand that it wasn't about men worship. It wasn't about what he has done or what he had uh, uh, accomplished. But it's what God is doing. And doing so in verse 1, he has a lot to say about who we are. Who we are. He said, let a man so account of us. To reckon, to, to, to understand, to, to make that logical accountability in our mind. As of the ministers of Christ and the stewards of the mysteries of God. The disciples, when they went out and God told them, Jesus told them, he says, I want you to go out and... I want you to go to this place. You'll find a cold. It's going to be tied. I want you to bring it to me. And I want you to, uh, to come and bring it to me. This is what they told the disciples. Jesus told them. You know, they didn't get up on top of the cold and parade themselves around and say, Worthy is the disciples of Christ. You know? You see that? Well, they put Christ on there. Blessed is the Son of God. Hosanna, glory to God in the highest. When it came time for the apostles to come on the scene, they knew they were nothing. Look at all the failures that they have been while Jesus was still yet on this earth. When God sent them out, they were timid. They didn't have any confidence in the flesh. They didn't even have confidence... Uh, in anything at that time until Jesus said, Tarry ye in Jerusalem until you be anointed with on high by the Holy Ghost, and, uh, but you shall receive the Spirit, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. And so the Holy Spirit, that they were able to do what they accomplished, it wasn't them that they were promoting or proclaiming or preaching, it was Christ that they were preaching. In other words, Paul was saying, it's not about me or what I've done. I didn't die for you. I didn't, wasn't baptized for you. Uh, none of this stuff. It's not about who I am. Sometimes ministries give an undue glorification. And people look up at the pastor, the preacher, the evangelist as if he is something. When all he is is just a vessel to be used of God. Noah built an ark. Moses constructed a bronze serpent and lifted it up in the wilderness. Where they were, children of Israel were to look and live. Elijah called down fire from heaven. Nineveh built a, uh, Nehemiah built a wall. Peter was sent to feed the lost sheep of Israel. Well, Jesus told him, he said, feed my sheep. As the apostles to the Jews. What was Paul's mission? He was a missionary. A preacher, an evangelist, a church planter. A vessel to bear the name of God to the Gentiles. That was his whole obligation. This was his whole duty. It wasn't something that was he placed upon his own life. It was something that God had placed upon his life. It doesn't matter what men thought of him about what they wanted him to do or what they thought, think that he ought to have done. But it's everything about what God wanted him to do. None of these examples were men who elevated themselves to the area of Pope. 
None of these are men who said, look at what I've done. Look at what I've accomplished. Look at what's, what happened as a result of my hands. None of them said that. And Paul won't say it either. These men had the philosophy of John the Baptist when, when people would come over to John the Baptist and say, hey look, this guy who you say is the lamb to take away the sin of the world, this guy that you baptized in the river, this guy that you said you weren't worthy to take the sandals off of his, his feet, you know him? He's baptizing more people than you. John, what do, what, what do you think that we ought to do? He says, I rejoice in the voice of the bridegroom. I must decrease, but he must increase. And that's what Paul was trying to say. Paul was saying, don't put me on a pedestal. I'm a debtor to all men. Both to the Greeks and the barbarians, the wise and the unwise. The rich and the poor alike. I, I've been given a mission to reach a lost and dying world who doesn't know the gospel. He says, reckon us as the ministers of Christ. And the word minister... There's a word that means one who is an under rower. You know, the only, the only thing that I, I, I can think of is I've, I've seen the pictures in the history books. I've seen them on the internet. And you'll see these guys at the bottom of a galley ship. And what they're doing, you see these hundreds of men, it looks like, in the pictures. And they have these oars sticking outside of the little windows as they're trying to get the ship to, to traverse the oceans. And, and the men will be under, and there's going to be a master over them. And they'll say, lift! And the men on the left are going to be rowing and rowing and rowing. But the ones on the right are not doing anything because they didn't give them any direction. Or if he says, to the right, the men on the right will be, he says, I'm an under rower following the directions of Christ. When Paul was recounting his own call that the Lord had given him, it says over in Acts 26, verse 16, I have, and the Lord said unto him, I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness. In other words, what I'm trying to say to you, though they looked at Paul and they thought, hey, buddy, you keep up that strong speech. We're not going to put up with that around here. You keep talking like that, we're not, we're not going to have any of that. Paul says, I'm not here of my own authority. I'm here under the authority of Christ. I'm not here with my own message, but it's the message of Christ. Christ sent me here. And that's why. He sent me with a message. To be a witness unto him, he has a position like that of a slave for Christ. He has a practice of total obedience to the captaincy of, of Jesus. As he says left or right, or as he says more or less, whatever Christ says, this is what he's doing, this is what he's compelled. And he can do no other, like Balaam said in the Old Testament. So I can't go beyond the words of Christ. When the men of Israel would have Paul to lift him up, to be something where some would say, I'm of Paul, or I'm of Apollos, or I'm of Peter, or even some of them said, I'm of Christ. I mean, I wouldn't have thought it was a bad thing to say, I'm of Christ, but he says, look, there's no parties here. We're all of one. And even when they tried to lift up Gideon, they said, well, we're going to make you rulers over us. Gideon said, hey, I'm not going to rule over you. The Lord, He shall rule over you. Me and my sons, we're not going to have any part of it. That's what Paul is saying here. He says, I'm not going to rule over you. That's somebody else. God has given gifts among men to edify the body of Christ, to do exactly what He's called you to do. He's giving you ministries. He's giving you gifts. He's giving you abilities. He's giving you talents and treasures, time. He's giving you all these things to be used for His glory. You are just... Yeah, I know we're a child of a king. I know we're the sons of God and how unworthy we are. But Paul says, I'm a servant of, I'm a servant of the Lord. Just a servant. And every one of you, you're no better than anybody else. All of you are servants too. This is what he's trying to communicate to him in this text. 
I've learned sometimes that undue pressure can be on ministers. And you know, you sit there and you have these revival meetings, and you'll be out there witnessing, and you'll be passing out tracts, and you're doing everything that you can. You're exhausting all of your energies, all your strength. I mean, you've been praying and pouring your heart out, preparing messages, and doing all that you can to win people to Christ and share the gospel message. And and I, I mean, you are just laboring your heart out all because this is what Christ has called you to do in a particular location. And you can be preaching for sometimes years on end, like Ed and I or Judson or like William Carey or some of the others. And people look at you and say, hey, buddy, you're wasting your time. We haven't seen a single convert. Nothing has happened. You know, just stop with that stuff. And people don't seem to understand that i got to be faithful. We want to keep on because we got to be faithful. God expects faithful obedience and we're to leave the results up to Him. It's not up to me to, to say, hey, you know, this is what I've done. Go up into heaven and say, hey, look at the tallies up here. I've won one million people to Christ. Sometimes it's laboring in the hard places. In the places where there's nothing but rocks. In the places where the thorns and the thistles are growing and you do all that you can. Uh, this, this is not even in the message, but uh, uh, it was just interesting to me that I was reading. I was getting ready to look up something on the internet and Google. You know, sometimes Google, uh, they, it doesn't matter. That's nothing to the point. But it says that South Carolina is the seventh worst in the vices in the Bible. Now, I don't know how they come up with the, uh, with the numbers. You know, I would think Nevada, maybe that was number one, I'm sure, or... California or something like that, but he said South Carolina is number seven. I thought we were in the Bible Belt. We were pretty good, but we were number seven in the vices. And not only are we ministers, everyone who's been saved by the grace of God, but we've been given a ministry as stewards. Stuart's one who's been given the responsibility, the resources of things that are not his own. In fact, we we look at the life of Joseph, a man who was sold into slavery, and he comes to Potiphar's house, and uh, you know, as he's sitting there and he's working, and he's, he has a charge over everything that he has. You can think to yourself, that is a high position. A steward wasn't something that people would just. I don't know. I don't think I could do that. That's that's too hard. A uh, steward was a man that was people. He was like the boss over to all the house, but as a slave. You see what I'm saying? And Joseph had, I mean, he could do all the business dealings, the buying, the selling, responsible for the feeding of the cattle, responsible for the oversight of the, uh, the other slaves who might be taking care of the properties around there, responsible for the things in the house, out of the house. Joseph was responsible over everything, but the resources weren't his own. And the authority that he had wasn't his own. If his master says, hey, Joseph, I want you to sell a hundred sheep today, guess what Joseph's doing? He's selling a hundred sheep. This is what a steward is. We could go through and look at the parables of Jesus where he gives the parables of the unjust steward. Remember the one, that I forget, it's in Luke somewhere. But Jesus gives the parable of the unjust steward and this master comes and he wants and he asks for an account of the stewardship because he hears that there's some misdealings going on. He says, uh, hey, you, you need to give an account. I'm hearing this about you and I want to know if this has been true. And he asks him to give an account and the steward begins to worry. He's, he, he's no longer twiddling his thumbs. He says, I got to do something. And he goes to one of the men who owes his master something. He says, sit down and write your bill and pay off half of what you owe right now. And he commends him for that. I'm, I'm not telling you to do that, okay? But the faithfulness. Because that unjust steward was not found faithful. He was shamed. He says to the dig, I am ashamed. Knowing that he was going to be put out of his stewardship. We are stewards. If it weren't so, why would the Apostle Paul write 1 Corinthians 12 through 14? Where he says, you've been given all of these gifts for the glory of God. Again, this stewardship carried a reputation. 
resources were allotted with it. And Paul says this, he says, I'm a wise administrator of the divine truths. I've, I've, I've labored, I've, I've given you the foundation as a wise master builder. Be careful how you build upon it. I'm a careful physician of the divine power. You remember as the, the apostles were given the abilities that nobody else was given. It's not like he was going out left and right and saying, hey, you're healed. When the snake comes and he bites on the hand of Paul, when he's uh, shipwrecked on the island of Miletus, he didn't go out and do that intentionally. He just shakes off. The... People wondered at him. People got saved. He doesn't waste his, uh, his ability to come and see people changed, healed, helped. But every bit of the, the, the abilities and powers and the, 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 all of it was because God blessed them with it. That's what I'm trying to tell you. People hear the gospel and you speak. People hear the gospel that you speak and they watch the gospel that you live. And are you faithful? Well, people get saved by watching your life. A lot of times we have a hundred different conversations throughout the course of a day or the weeks or the months. And you guys have people that you're rubbing shoulders with every single day. You talk to them. I don't know what you talk to them about. I don't know if it's the sports or the politics or, or the things that are happening in town or what's going on in church or what. But when people hear what's coming out of your lips, do they hear the voice of a Christian? The voice of one who's persuaded about their Christ? The voice of one who... Uh, magnifies the name of Christ. I've shown you who we are. We're the ministers. We're the under rowers. We're stewards. But now I want you to see who we who we belong to. We're ministers of Christ. We're stewards of God. That's whom we belong to. But we've been bought with a price. And he says uh, we are the ministers of Christ, and the stewards of God is what he uh, boils it down to. We're to receive instruction from the throne room of God and carry them out on earth to the utmost of His power. There's nothing to boast about, nothing that I can say, hey, I did this. In no respect are we to seek our own things. In fact, when, when Christ died on the cross and I accepted His perfect salvation, guess who died on the cross as well? But you are dead. This is what Paul tells him over in Romans chapter 6. You were buried with him like his baptism unto death. The old man is to be dead. Say goodbye to your will. Go say goodbye to the things that you, you desire. It's Christ's desire that you ought to desire. He'll give you the desires of your heart. He'll show you His will. He'll lead you the way that you ought to go. And no respect are we to seek our own things, but always God's. We must act in a way that the eyes of God were always upon us. And here it is, so that we can always give a good account at that coming day of Jesus Christ. Even coming to church today, you know God notices. He notices everything that we do throughout the course of the week. We are His. Our stewardship doesn't just end and begin or begin and end here at church, but it, it's throughout your life, the only time, the end of the time. He says, therefore, verse 5, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come who will bring to light the hidden things of darkness. And we must be found faithful. You know, you give somebody a job and they're out there and they're working, doing whatever you ask them to do. It's, it's crazy. Sometimes you can go and check on people and you know what they're doing? They're there on their cell phones. How did I find them? <laughs> hey, what are you doing? I told you to dig this hole. You know, they're on your cell phone. You give them instructions to, to clean a room or whatever have you. You tell them to go do something. You go back and check on them and they're playing. You're like, didn't I tell you to clean your room? When Jesus Christ comes, He says, Shall I find faith on this earth? It's one thing to be faithful now, or 
or maybe faithful later, but is that faithfulness, is that consistent? When Jesus Christ comes, it could be any time. It could be morning, noon, or night. Whatever the time that the Lord comes, I'm not sure. I just know that He's coming. Will you be found faithful? And this is what He calls us to. Faithful in our living. Faithful in our lifestyle. Faithful in our actions. Faithful in our stewardship. Faithful as ministers for Christ. Paul says, I finished my course. I've kept the faith. But you know there was one man named Demas who had forsaken him. These are things and principles for which we should live for are bigger than ourselves. And it shows us, this first verse shows us we are accountable and whom we are accountable to. And sometimes we, we say this, sometimes, you know, I've heard this a hundred times growing up. Many of you could probably say amen to this. But I heard these words, Brother Tommy. As long as you are under my roof, right? Have you heard those? As long as you are under my roof, this is how you're going to behave. This is how you're going to act. This is what you're going to do. You get your own house, then you can do what you want, but right now you're under my roof. Well, I think that we could all say that we're under God's authority, we're under His roof. And we've got to stop acting any way that we think that we can get away with. I move on to the requirement. Uh, in 1776, a groomsman was defined as somebody... You know, today we think a groomsman. A groomsman is somebody who stands up there at a wedding and uh, doesn't have to do anything. You know, it's a good position to be as, in a wedding, right? You stand up there, you look good. But in 1776, a groomsman was a person who took care of the horses. And George Washington was up there in Trenton, New Jersey. And there was a battle going on, the colonial army against the British, and there was just a great big war going on. You know this from the history. December 26, 1776, there was a man who was uh, part of um, George Washington's army. In fact, his, his, his name was Jocko. What a name to have, right? And Jocko was the son of Tom Graves. Tom Graves was a black man who signed up to fight in, a, in this revolutionary war. He didn't have to, but he signed up to do it. His son, Jocko, wanted to be in the war as well. And in fact, when George Washington was ready to go out, the thing that he did, he said, Hey, I want to go too. George Washington looked at this 12-year-old little boy. He says, uh, Son, he gave him this respectable position for, you know, he says, You don't need to be in the war. It gets bloody, it's messy out here. I want you to stay by the horses. I want you to keep the horses. The battle is going to be raging on through the, through, 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 the, through the day. At the end of the night, we're going to need to get back to our encampment. We've got to know where it is. If you want to do us a favor, the greatest thing that you can contribute to this war, I want you to light a candle and a lantern, and I want you to stand upon the shore of the river here. Because at night we need to know where our encampment is, and when we come back, we'll, we'll, we'll be sure to find it. And as the battle raged on, this little boy, well, as soon as it got to be uh, darkening toward, toward the dust, he lit that candle, he went out by the, the riverside, and he stood there faithfully holding that lantern the whole time. And during that night, nobody knew it. There would come a winter storm. And the storm turned into a blizzard, and I mean, it began to be a, a great big snowfall. But guess who's standing by the riverside holding that lantern, that little boy? It got to be cold. The temperatures dropped greatly. And all through the night, that little boy held that lantern up high so everybody could see it, so that the soldiers could get back. He didn't leave his post. He kept it there. Uh, the soldiers weren't able to return because of the blizzard, weren't able to cross the river during that time. They had to wait till morning. But in the morning when they crossed the river, George Washington and his army came where that little boy was still holding that lantern except for he was dead. Hypothermia had taken over, done its work, and he had frozen to death, but that candle was still lit, that lantern was still lit, and he was still holding it till his dying day. I'm just saying that faithfulness is not just turn to good times. He had been given a commission and he fulfilled that commission all the way through the night. That's what this little boy did. One command that's for us to be followed is to be found faithful. And notice the faithfulness is not a suggestion. 
It's not just when you feel like it. It's not when you think that it's a, a good time to be working. It's not when uh, it's convenient for you. Hebrews 6 tells us this, Don't be slothful as followers of them who through faith and patience and hatred to promises. Abraham kept following God when he called him out of the Ur of the Chaldees. So I said, where are you going? I don't know, we're just following God. Brings him over to Canaan and into that little land there. Sets up on Hebron and he builds an altar to the Lord. He's praising God. Sets up an altar seeking God and he follows him there. Uh, he's following God everywhere, here, there, yonder place, and just a, one step after another looking for that, uh, uh, that city whose builder and maker was God is what the book of Hebrews tells us. It's interesting to note this. Brother Sheila, you know, some people call their cars or their old trucks. You see this here, this 1957 Chevy? This is old faithful, right? She never left me, broke down on the side of the road one time. I won't say whether it's a Chevy or a Ford or anything like that. They look at the rifles and they say, see this here? This old Henry rifle. This is old faithful. I keep it up on the mantle. I can always I killed a lot of deer with this. The other ones have let me down, and this one's always been faithful. I go in and they show you the dog. See this dog here? He's faithful. Every time I come to the door, he's always running up to me and he's excited to see me. He's always been faithful. I've taken him out hunting and he's always got a, a raccoon or whatever the case may be, whatever he's hunting. Uh, but he's faithful. That's the point. You know, I've never found a person that people overlook at him and they say, hey, this is old faithful over here. I only found one exception to the rule. It's found over in Galatians chapter 3. And it talks about faithful Abraham. Have anybody, have you ever met somebody like that? This is old faithful. Now they'd rather name the geyser after that. And even that's not faithful anymore. The book of Proverbs tells us, chapter 20, Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find word goodness is that of a covenantal kind of love, and they'll go out and say, Oh, uh, uh, honey, I, I love you, and they'll get up. I mean, they'll just lavish with words, whatever. The covenantal, that faithful, that relationship love, the same love that God says He has to the nation of Israel. And God's always been faithful. They say every man will go out and proclaim his own goodness, his own, his own love, his own devotion to something or somebody, but the action's not there. Every man from their own lips will proclaim it, but a faithful man, who can find the one who backs it up with his actions because talk is cheap? John Butler in his uh, Bible expositor commentary says this, if you want to prove your worth, be faithful. We have a tendency to think that it's more important to be famous or flashy than to be faithful, but the faithful fire of the furnace is more valuable than the spectacular fire of the fireworks in the 4th of July. Those who are not faithful, guess what happens to them? Again, Jesus has given many, many different parables about the, the, the stewards. The one that I mentioned, the unjust steward, he says, you, you're disqualified from your stewardship. But there are several others where Jesus said, I give you ten talents, I give you five talents, I give you three talents, I give you one talent. A man with one talent, what does he do? He takes it, he buries it into the sand, and what does he tell Jesus when he comes? Full of excuses. Oh Lord, I knew, I just, I knew you were a hard man. I, I knew you were austere. I know you reap where you did not sow. I mean, he just, here's back. Your money. Jesus calls him an unprofitable servant. There's a lot of people that have all kinds of excuses under the sun why they can't do this or why they can't do that. I think one of the first things that children learn is how to make the excuses, right, Miss Kim? And it doesn't stop when they get older. Lord, I knew. The psalmist cried out in Psalm, verse, Psalm chapter 12, verse 1. It says, Help, Lord, 
For the godly man ceaseth, and the faithful fail from among the children of men. So one time they used to be faithful in the church, but I can't find them anymore. One time they used to be faithful uh, people over the community, and we can't find them anymore. So many people. This is for the faithful fail from among the children of men. No longer to be found. Successful people are faithful people. It's one who's been given God's resources. We've got to ask ourselves, am I using them in relationship to my stewardship? Because everything entrusted to me is a stewardship, and we are required to be found faithful. So what does it mean to be found faithful? It means to be predictable. I can always count on you being over there. If you say you want to do something, I can always count on you doing it. I can always count on the phone call whenever I'm sick. I can always count on the flowers when I'm in the hospital. I can always count on this because this person's always been faithful. It means to be dependable to the end. Faithful people are the kind that the pastor leans upon. You know, he goes looking for faithful people. Whether it's uh, for a choir, whether it's for a position, whether it's for whatever position it may be. You're looking for faithful people. But it's one thing that the Corinthian church was negligible on. Being faithful is not to personalities. It's not. Paul says, I don't have to please you. It's not faithful to personal goals. Paul, we should be doing this. It's not to agendas. Paul was only in Corinth for a space of three years. Now he does say that I had the care of all the churches on my heart. He's still writing letters back to them. He's still concerned. He's still praying for them. He's still rejoicing in them. He still loves them. But Paul says, God has called me to the next church and to the next church. And to the, because my, what God has called me to is not limited just to court. I'm a, an apostle to the Gentiles. That was his calling. That's what he was to be faithful to. His timing was God's timing. He would be there when God gets him there. The duration was God's duration. He'll be there as long as God wants him there. His responsibility was to do the will of God, not what he wanted. And Jesus says this, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. You get to looking back. Oh, it was good back in the good old days. You get to looking around about what your friends are doing or, uh, or what this person's doing or what that person's doing. Uh, you're, Jesus said, you're not fit. You get looking at the circumstances. Oh, well, the ground is hard and it's tough. No, you put your hands to the plow and don't look back. The relationship, the requirement, now the reason. Remember what Paul wrote in chapter 3? He says, every man's work should be tried by the fire. And Paul revisits this again uh, for the reason of faithfulness. And I like what Paul says in verses 3 through 4. He says, But with me it's a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not my own self. And it seems to me like the Apostle Paul has heard some things here and there. And he's hearing about some of the judgment that's been cast against him. And I'm sure that it hurt. But when you're living for Christ, to be hurt by what man has to say, it's a small thing. Yeah. It bothered Jeremiah. It bothered Isaiah. It bothered Paul. Nobody was more ridiculed. Nobody was more mistreated. Nobody was more mishandled than the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. As He faithfully goes out and He uh, does all these miracles and He sees people healed and He sees people saved by the grace of God and yet they are the same ones who are turning their backs upon Him. So, oh, He had the spirit of Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. Nobody was more mistreated than Him. You think that stopped Him from going to a cross? I think somebody, probably the second next to the 
uh, Lord Jesus Christ himself or the Apostle Paul when he's going out and the only thing that he's trying to do is help the churches and encourage the churches and meet the needs and write to them and see them established and confirming the souls and doing all that he can to do what God has called him to do and people were casting judgment. He had problems with the Judaizers. He had problems with Demas forsaking him. And in fact, when he goes into the prison, no man standing with him. I'm sure that had to hurt. But he says it's a very small thing to be judged of you or of man's judgment. To be honest with you, this kind of judgment is on a very rocky road because the Bible tells us over in 1 Timothy chapter 4, in the last days, not only should perilous times come, but they shall heap up for themselves teachers having itching ears. And these Corinthians were well on that path as they were looking for the ones whom they liked to listen to. The Corinthians didn't know everything about them. They didn't know what God had called them to do. They didn't know how hard that Paul had tried. They didn't know how many times the Apostle Paul had cried. In fact, he lays it all out for them in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 just to show them, hey, I'm human too. I've been beaten with rods with 40 stripes save one. A night in the deep was I left out in the sea, robbed, naked, left in perils, imprisoned. They don't know the hours that he had worked, the people that he had visited and counseled. They didn't know his love for them or the dark days that uh, he has been through. They didn't know uh, his motivations. They didn't know the counsels of his heart. That's for God to judge. And so it was a very little thing for the people to judge him. They don't know him. And Jesus said of men in John chapter 2, verses 24 and 25, But Jesus did not commit Himself unto them, because He knew all men, and He needed not that any man should testify of man, for He knew what was in man. Oh, that's... <laughs> Paul said, I dare not even to judge my own self, because He knew what the Scripture said about His heart. It's deceitful. I can believe I'm a good person all that I want to. Hey God, I've been faithful. Hey God, do you see what I've been through? You see what I've done? You see what I've accomplished? Paul said, my heart's deceitful. I can deceive myself to think that I'm doing a good job. I can deceive myself and think that I don't have to do more than what I'm doing. I can deceive myself to think that I have some excuses. Hearts deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. The only estimation ends at the end of the day is what Christ has said. Paul says, I know nothing by myself. It's only Him that's able to search and to try our hearts. Even David cried out in the Psalms, Search me and try me and see if there be any wicked way within me. Let the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. But even He didn't know. So I know nothing by myself. He that judgeth me is the Lord. We see God's judgment. As to the Lord that we stand or fall. And this timing of the judgment is not uh, at one point of time. Oh, Paul, you did good here with Corinth. Paul, you did good here with the Thessalonians. Paul, you did good with the Bereans. But, he <laughs> says, judge nothing before the time when the whole life, your whole life has been consummated from beginning to end and it's all wrapped up in a ball. It's going to be that very thing that God judges, it's not going to be just at one point in time in your life where you were faithful, but it's going to be the whole, whole end of your life from beginning to end. From the point of salvation on, what have you done with the stewardship? What have you done with the ministry that He's given to you? It says, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come. And what you've been up to this point doesn't determine what you will be. I'm sure Demas thought, I'm faithful, but at the end of the day, he departed. Peter even said to himself, I'll never deny thee. At the end of the day, he did. 
I know many who started out with me in Bible college, men and women both alike. People that in Bible college, people would have said, hey, they're going to do great things for God. <coughs> These guys, I mean, they, they are eloquent preachers. They, they are able to do, have the, the best children's ministry and the best VBS and the best this and the best that. And, and I mean, they are eloquent in their voice. And yet when they get out, it's not too long, but they begin to deny the things that they have learned, the things that are faithful and true that's been committed unto them. And they begin to doubt everything that they have learned. And they've turned their back upon the faith. And Timothy says, or Paul tells Timothy, in the latter times many shall depart from the faith. Since in the latter times, God just want to bring to light the hidden things of darkness. So oh, that hurts. And the counsels of our hearts. Here the believers told by Paul that under the fiery holy glaze of the Lord's hidden things of darkness beyond the comprehension of mortal men, the very purpose, the counsels of the heart, why he does what he does, will be made known. And then he shall have praise, God's praise. God's praise. God doesn't give any free trophies in heaven. They do it here on this earth. They want everybody to feel good. Here's your participation award. But you won't get it in heaven. The praise that you receive is not because you desire that praise, but it'll be because you deserve that praise. Because every man's work will be tried by fire. Let me just hit the response here real quick. Uh, the humility. Paul casts this little bit of satire in verse 8 as he begins to lay out his estimation here. He says, uh, now you are full, now you are rich, now you reigned as kings without us, and I would to God that you did reign, that we also might reign without you, or, 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 or might reign with you, is what he says. And you know, the, the Bible is very colorful in the way that it casts different things, and the way it speaks to things. And this is Paul's just little bit of sarcasm, I would say. And Paul says, you know, you, you guys think that you've arrived. You guys are excited about what you've accomplished. You, you are sitting high and you think that you're rich. You have all these things. We look at the gifts that you've been given. Look at the place that you are. Look at the people that are surrounding you. Look at the people that magnify your name. And now all of a sudden you think that you reign as a king, that you are able to cast judgment against somebody else. I wish to God that you did reign. That is over your own flesh. Over your own spirit. That you might have that holiness and humility that was in Christ. Then he sees the faithful activity, verses 9 through 16, as we can look down through and won't for a space of time. But it's really a model life of someone who is called into faithful living. Paul says, You want to know what a minister is? What a steward is? He's weak when you're strong. He's cast aside as a spectacle of the world. When you have everything that's fine for you. He, he feels the hurts. He feels the pain. He feels the suffering. He feels the sorrow while you get to rejoice. You have all things. He says, we're fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise. We are weak, but you're strong. You are honorable, but we are despised, Paul says. That's what a steward is. He has to go through many different things. But he doesn't... He doesn't look at it as something that is regrettable. He looks at it as something that's honorable. I am doing this because Christ loves me and because people need to be saved and people need to be reached and churches need to be planted and this world needs to be uh, have that light of the gospel shine upon them. We need to be salt and light. Paul didn't regret it. I end with this illustration. Dr. Ed Brooks Bowles said that when he was 13 years old, him and his mother, his brother, all of them were called into the hospital room. 
his father was there and he got the news that he was passed into eternity. His father was a pastor and he pastored for a number of years, over 40 years I believe. And uh, I mean it was just heartbreaking time for him. He didn't know how to respond. He says, I responded as any little boy would. He always had this practice of going up next to his dad and putting his arms around his neck and just being able to depend upon him. And so that's what he did. He, though his father was departed, and his spear was already with God, and all that was left was his body. He climbed up into that bed and he put his arms around his father and he began to weep. He said, words came to me and he said, Dad, I will follow in your steps. He said the words were spoken in sincerity, but the meaning wasn't really fully realized. Dad, I'll follow in your steps. He pastored for many years. Dad, I'll follow in your steps. And several years later, God did impress upon his heart that he was called to preach. and went to the Bible school and uh, went out and he faithfully pastored a church for many years. So the vow that I made to my father surfaced with a singular significance. Dad, I'll follow in your steps, followed him day by day. The memory of it is one that was treasured moments, uh, the treasured moments of my life. And when I meet him again in heaven, I want to be able to say, Dad, I kept my vow. I followed in your steps. And how great will your joy be when you come to life's setting sun and we can say to our Heavenly Father, I have kept the faith as the Apostle Paul has done. You got to be faithful to do that. When Paul says, I wasn't disobedient to the heavenly vision, you got to be faithful to do that. And it's not easy, but it's worth it. You know who gets the rewards? The faithful minister, the faithful stewards. They get the rewards and they get the praise of God. Let us be found. Faithful. I'm not asking you to be faithful according to your judgment. But be faithful to what God has called you to do. I'm glad that uh, when the mowing ministry starts, everybody knows, people all up and down this road knows, and other people knows when the summer begins, those who are going to be mowing down at the bottom of the yard. So we see that uh, old man down there. I say, yeah. Uh, in his 80s, still down there cutting grass. <laughs> I guess you're not 80 yet, right? But you're getting there, right? Uh, don't mean to cause offenses, brother. <laughs> but they know you. They do. Because they know you're faithful. Well, let's uh, pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this time together around your word. Lord, there's probably many things that we like to convince ourselves of. But the one thing that matters, are we faithful? There's no doubt in my mind that there's people here who feel the weight of those words. And I know that every one of us could do better, that's for sure. We need to be found faithful. And Lord, I pray that you'll help drive that within our hearts, our minds, challenge us. Challenge these here. If there's some here that uh, have not been faithful and you've convicted their hearts, Lord, I want you to uh, do what only you can do to make a, a, a not a goal, not a commit. Just do, just be obedient. Just be obedient to what God asks us to do, and I pray that they'll learn to to be obedient right now, to be faithful every time that the doors are open. That they will be here. That they'll be faithful to you. Not to me, not to the church, but to you. And Lord, may you convict us, may you try us at this moment of time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Are you saved? Do you know that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins? And only through Him do we have a home in heaven. And two, oh, the most hardest sermon of all. Does the one preach to yourself, will God find me faithful? Maybe some of you need to make decisions. By God's grace, I will be faithful from this point forward. Let's stand to our feet. If God's working in your heart, you can pray in your seat or you can pray standing. However, 
But let's turn to hymn number 244 as we sing Amazing Grace. think about faithfulness, I think of Miss Ola by the side of her husband, 90 some years old and still taking care of him beyond strength or beyond ability, she does it. And, uh, you know, some people, some people unfortunately are not faithful to marriages like she is. Uh, let us be faithful. Brother Sheely, would you dismiss us in a word of prayer?